This is Rosa Shaw, and I'm here to guide you through the daily activities, events, and the ins and outs of what occurs on the street. So sit back, relax, enjoy your cup of coffee, purchase one with some popcorn bucks, and enjoy a word from the metaverse. Hello, Rosa Shaw here, speaking to you from a small cafe adjacent to the famous Black Sun Bar, giving you the latest on what is happening on the street. What is affecting our world? So on this show, we're going to talk about Peter Steele. You can see almost uh, the makings of a uh, bond building, if you will. Something that Elon Musk always gets to see. You, the adage attached to it, if you will. But here we're going to talk about Peter Steele and his um, program that he has that is going to track uh, Muslim Americans uh, and immigrants in general within the United States. But before we talk about Peter Thiel and um, and his program, we're going to do a little bit of news. So, hackers take over our Randolph County radio station alert system and send out messages about fake zombie attacks. Uh, This is something that's been very frequent um, occurring throughout the country, I would say the last five to seven years, where you will have um, those road signs that will say things like Velociraptors ahead or zombie attack or some kind of goofy sign, uh, signage, if you will, attached to these uh, road signs. And now radio stations are being attacked. Uh, this article comes from Fox 59, uh, Winchester, Indiana. The Randolph County Sheriff's Department is assuring residents there is no zombie outbreak in the area. The department says that the radio station WZZ why many 3 fell victim to hackers who got into the system and issued alerts about a zombie attack and a disease outbreak from diseased bodies. Uh, there's no local emergency, the department said on Facebook. We have contacted the radio station and notified the Indiana Department of Homeland Security. Again, this is no emergency or disease outbreak in Randolph County. An investigation mm-hmm. is underway as to how the hackers gain access to the alert system. This is also something that's been happening to radio stations, uh, very small local ones, um, mostly on the eastern board, uh, seaboard, if you will, in the United States, where people have been able to hack into the, uh, the radio station. You're utilizing um, the emergency broadcast system or a particular uh, avenue within the radio station, a frequency that's not frequently used by the radio station to play uh, anti Trump songs. So now, um, it seems some jokers have now up their game and have now done, um, done zombie alert to be well. This comes from the Chronicle of Higher Education, written by Shannon uh, Najobi. Me? The math professor who's fighting gerrymandering with uh, geometry. At Tufts University, Professor has proposed to combat gerrymandering by giving more geometry experts a day in court. Moon Dunshin is an associate professor of math and director of science, technology, and society program at Tufts. She realized last year that some of her research about metric geometry could be applied to gerrymandering, the practice of manipulating the shape of an electrical district to benefit a specific party, which is widely seen as a major contributor to the government dysfunction. At first, she says her plans are straightforward and research oriented, but put together a team to do some modeling that may be a consult with the state redistricting commission. But then she got more creative. I became convinced it's probably more effective to help train a big new generation of expert witnesses who know the math side pretty well, she says. In part, she said that because court cases over border districts have risen since a 2013 Supreme Court decision that Shelby County versus Holder struck down a key part of the voting rights after 1965. Uh, former President Barack Obama is said to be making a redistricting a focus effort of his presidency, and the former Attorney General H. Holder Jr. is leading a new Democratic group targeting gerrymandering man- ahead of 2021. The next time district lines will be, be uh, drawn. Before the Shelby decision, some states and localities with a history of racial discrimination were required to get federal clearance before redrawing electrical districts or making other changes in the election laws. Change to voting rules that used to be considered by courts before they could be implemented since this nothing and now implemented first, and the courts consider them after the fact. Because of the increase in cases challenging new electoral maps, she says, there's a need for an expert witness who understands the mathematical concepts of the Google to gerrymandering. 
To meet the need, she spearheaded the creation of a five-day summer program at Tufts that aims to train mathematicians to do just that. The first three days of the program will be open to the public and available online, while lessons that put redistricting in legal, historical, civil so rights, and mathematical contents. Attendees of the program find two days will participate in one of the three specialized tracks on giving expert testimony, teaching, and working with geographic information systems. The summer program created in partnership with the law, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law was announced late in January. Already, Ms. Justin says over 900 people have indicated their interest by signing up for a mailing list. But what, we, what was really a rock that she said is that the mailing list didn't say sign up if you care about German. They said, we want to train mathematicians as expert witnesses. That's very specific. Overwhelmed by the interest, Ms. Duncan and the Metric Geoma Geometry and Geomounting Group, or MGGGG, a five person group founded by Ms. Duncan, that is organized in the summer school, decided to hold additional training in California, North Carolina, Texas, and Wisconsin later this year. It's clear that this is a big, right moment to do this kind of work, says Ms. Duncan. We want to harness all the energy. So, this is very good and important how science, if you will, or mathematical principles have been around for a very long time. They're now being utilized in a real world fashion in, in a different in a different manner. Uh, there is a case, and I think we'll talk about it um, sometime later down the road, about Kansas City and about the redistricting in Kansas City with voting, in fact, about their voting machines and fraud and how um, it's been mathematically proven that there was a significant manipulation in the state of Kansas within the last, I would say, eight years um, with two provable um, elections, that there has been manipulation of the fact that the different types of voting that was occurring and, and how that uh, that information, particularly how it's being hidden from the public. Uh, there was a statistician that went about doing research and it was an ongoing matter, but uh, this is just, I think, a very good thing. I think it's the fact that there's an open open available online, that you can go to this place, that uh, a lot of this uh, effort is being made towards gerrymandering and addressing um, the way districts are, are mapped, if you will. Because if you look at any, it doesn't matter what state you're in, any state, and look at some of the, uh, the way the districts are drawn, I think, like, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and California are kind of in the worst states when it comes to gerrymandering, the way that the, the districts are mapped out. I mean, California is just utterly ridiculous if you look um, at the way they map their districts. But great effort on the part of this individual in, in trying to make an effort making this happen. The Internet Archive blogs. Uh, this is by Lily Bailey. Internet Archive pushes back on notices stay down in recent comments to the Copyright Office. The U.S. Copyright Office sought comments in an ongoing study of the Digital Millennial Copyright Act, or, or the DMCA, BO, uh, Section 5112, the Safe Harbor Study. They are generally looked to find out how well the notice and takedown system is working for everyone, the Internet platforms and users, as well as to creators and copyright holders. We think the 1998 statute struck the right balance and is generally working well. The view shared by nearly all internet platforms and users, but there are significant issues with the DCA, DMCA in general. However, some incumbent rights shareholders and their advocacy organizations disagree and think the system needs to be completely redone because it's too hard to police copyright infringement online. These complaints fail to account for the exceeding high statutory damages right holders can claim and other mechanisms in copyright law that favor certain categories of right shareholders over new media creators and consumers. One dangerous idea that the right shareholders continue to push for is notice of stay down system. It sounds like a minor edit to notice and stake down, but in reality it would amount to mandatory filtering of the internet for the purpose of policing copyright. Last summer we noted that many of the general reasons why this idea is both dangerous and impractical. In our most recent comments we focus more specifically on the direct threats such as system opposed to the internet archive and our various projects, such as the Wayback Machine and the TV News Archive. So basically what it is, is they want these copyright holders, the, um, you know, the big content creator holders, if you will, the, the music, television, just name whatever industry, want like places like Google or Facebook to be so strict in their policing that they're going to take down or 
remove search indexes of different websites or anything like that without any considera consideration of fair usage, whether or not the individual actually has a license to distribute the copyrighted material, any of that type of means. There's no um, really strong mechanisms, if you will, to protect the individual or company or holder of the person distributing the information. It's just going to be take down, take down, take down. Um, this is what a lot of gripe with YouTube has had with um, fair usage and like anything from like 30 second music clips to uh, critiques about movies, games, all sorts of types of things that can be uh, a serious hamper on uh, freedom of speech and censorship. Uh, people have the right to review, critique, criticize, judge, you will, any type of uh, material out there. And they can display it in a fair use ma manner, an educational manner, by saying, okay, this part of the song, da da da, this type of a beat, these type of lyrics, breakdowns, things of that, that nature. And it's just so random who gets taken down, who doesn't get taken down, what is considered a violation, what is not. And uh, it's important that you know the Internet Archive, an organization that goes around and catalogs the internet to preserve information, preserve history, if you will, because so much of it is going digital, it's no longer in a hard copy form. Um, this could actually hinder or hamper them because they do have, you know, movies, they do have uh, television shows, they do have clips of copyrighted material that they keep uh, on the Wayback Machine as a way of preserving that point in history. So, in general, the DMCA. Um, it is what we have right now, but it just, oh, it is not the best thing when you think about the progression of uh, human knowledge, if you will. Reddit is being manipulated by big financial services companies by Jay McGrath. Reddit is being regularly manipulated by large financial service companies with fake accounts and fake upvotes via seemingly ordinary internet marketing agencies. I work with a number of accounts on Reddit that can use to change the conversation and make it a bit more positive. This way, the startling admission of a professional working in market agency that in a phone call with me openly brag about manipulating conversations on Reddit. This is, wasn't a one-off nor was a result of weeks of plumbing the depths of the dark web looking for shilling services. Hiding this agency and several others took less than a few hours of basic Googling. Basically, Reddit for sale, part two of big business. The business of internet shilling, uh, posing as a genuine forum user, but being an employee of a corporation to promote their work is booming. And it's been for a long time. From fake Amazon reviews, which has now changed to where Amazon only allows up to 10 reviews per account, to the U.S. Army astroturf and social media, um, which has been um, documented. Uh, comment manipulation is old as the very concept of internet platforms, you know, soft copy accounts, is what they're called. Uh, fake comments and fake conversations being hard to spot, especially when they're made by specialized agencies making sure in big business. Nowhere is this more apparent than on Reddit. Being the world's uh, 22nd most popular website, and the U.S. 7th most, the 7th makes it a popular target because of the hundreds of millions of eyeballs it attracts every month. In December last year, I managed to post two entirely fake news stories onto an influential subreddit with a million subscribers and voted them to the top with the fake accounts that they got votes for less than 200. It was simple, cheap, and effective. What I hadn't realized at the time was how widespread this shilling issue was. Professional marketing agencies with offices in several different companies offer these services often under the guise of reputation management. They don't specifically talk about manipulating conversations online instead of using coded dog whistle language like target techniques and computer slander. But to verify these companies were selling professional forum manipulations, I had to get in contact. So I developed a backstory and called a few agencies. And then the story continues on. And this basically is just talking about the manipulation of the uh, information online, which used to be something, you know, propaganda machines, which used to be in the purview of, you know, governments. Um, and big business has done this for a very long time. A lot of their ad agencies and science that they um, fund is more favorable to say that, you know, Sugary sodas are not bad for you, if you will. But a lot of like court cases and, in fact, um, truth in advertising, um, which is a law, has come in where you can't really directly do that. So they're doing like, this more soft approach to manipulate financial markets. And given what the revelations about the gold market being manipulated, the silver market being manipulated, the oil market being manipulated, 
um, what was his HBG banking? I think is the name of the bank that got busted a couple years ago for laundering money for the drug cartel and the billions. Um, I'm not surprised the big business is doing this. I'm not surprised it's being done on Reddit. I just get calls out all the time. But it's becoming more increasingly difficult to delineate between someone who actually has a, a, a good critique about a particular product or actual praise to um, someone who's being paid to do so. And so I don't know what Reddit's solution is going to be for this. I don't know if they can have a type of solution if they have to use bots and humans and stuff like that. But um, it is something that's been occurring has been occurring for years and it's no surprising. And Reddit's not the only Mm-hmm. Facebook, any social media site, Twitter, Instagram, these, these things are occurring. So, last story, and this is very cyberpunk, if you will, is DNA could be the future of data storage. If you ever saw the movie uh, Man of Steel, it's kind of a bit of a trash movie, but in the movie, one of the plot points was that uh, Superman's father, Zora, I took the entire genome will of Krypton and sent it with his son to Earth. And it turns out that that information, the entire genetic material of Krypton is within Superman. And it's one of the plot points of Zod was to get that information so he can rebuild the Kryptonian race and uh, build it on Earth because they they believe in genetic manipulation and a caste system where you're designed for a purpose within their society. You know, you're a scientist, a warrior, a farmer, whatever your designation is, is your genetic code is encoded with that. And now um, there's been a, a number of different avenues that are looking at DNA to store information. So full operating system and film stored on DNA were recovered with no errors. The world is turning out so much data that hard drives may not be able to keep up, leading researchers to look at DNA as a possible storage medium. DNA is an ultra compact that doesn't degrade over time mm-hmm. like the sets and CDs. In a new study, Yvonne Elrish and Diane Zonsinki demonstrate that DNA's full potential and reliability for storing data. The researchers wrote six files, a full, a full computer operating system, an 1895 French film, an Amazon gift card, a computer virus, a pioneer plaque, and a study by information theorist Claude Shannon into 7,000. K DNA strands, each 200 base long. They then used the sequence technology to retrieve the data and software to translate the genetic code back into binary. The files were recovered with no error, and we spoke with Elrich about the results and what they mean for the future of data storage. So this is an entire article about um, that conversation. Um, I'm going to read some of the questions here. Um, ResearchGate asked, what motivated the study? Uh, Yavin Elrich, as a humanity produces data at, at a faster rate each year, progress in traditional data storage technologies has dramatically slowed over the last five years. That means we need to think about new approaches for data storage. Um, RG, how does your study fit into this effort? We show that we can reliably store information on DNA and that our organization of information approaches optimal packing, meaning it's nearly impossible to fit more information on the same amount of DNA material the sort of film, an operating system, and other types of data and DNA models. And then it kind of goes on. So imagine if you could have the entire existence of human history, if you will, on your person. It's not in a computer chip, not in some um, augmentation or anything like that, but actually within your body. And it can be retrieved at any time. Imagine if, you know, you're going to Mars or whatever to be able to store all the information about how to farm or to build or to anything like that to be in the DNA of the astronauts and all they have to do is uncode it with a much smaller machine instead of bringing all that information with them. Imagine if you know civilization collapses or whatever. Well there will be people that will be able to use their DNA if they will, retrieve that information from within themselves and rebuild civilization. Uh, there's a lot of potential to be ability to transmit information across uh, securely and secretly, if you will, across borders could occur, could be contained with someone's uh, DNA. So, a lot of a lot of, a lot of impl- implications for this. Uh, this is just the beginning of this type of uh, technology and study. It'll be 
interesting to see where we'll go from here. So that is it for the news. On to Peter Thiel. So who is Peter Thiel? You probably have heard of his name because he's been part of pretty much the, I guess he's his third, maybe fourth wave of the big tech companies that are going to be social media companies that are dominating things now. Um, he was an initial investor in Facebook. He made his bones to uh, PayPal, which he co-founded with Elon Musk. Uh, he's responsible for uh, financing um, a number of different uh, companies through his uh, organization called the Founders Fund. Um, things like LinkedIn, uh, Yelp. Uh, let's see, what's another big one? You know, uh, QR, which is a question and answer type thing. Uh, like I said, he was part of LinkedIn with Reed and Hoffman. Uh, he's he's done a lot of things and made a lot of big money for himself. Um, he also had a, uh, a huge uh, capital fund called the Clarion Capital, where they bet against the weakening the dollar, the oil market. They took a hit in the uh, uh, global financial system, but they actually kind of predicted the housing bubble and things of that nature. That particular program that he has, our company should actually say is not doing as well and, um, as it has as so in the past. But the company that we are talking about, the one that we founded in 2003, you know, PayPal was founded in 1999. Um, Facebook, of course, uh, was founded in, uh, or his investment was in 2004, is a Clarion Capital. Um, no, actually, we're talking about planting. So, in May 2003, this is coming from Wicca, uh, Thiel Incorporated Planter Technologies, a big data analysis company after the Tolkien artifact. It continues to serve as chairman as of 2016. Thiel stated the idea of the company was based on the realization that the approaches that PayPal had used to fight fraud be extended to other contexts, like fighting terrorism. He also stated that after September 11th and tax, the debate in the United States was, will we have more security with less privacy or less security with more privacy? And Salas Planter was as being able to provide data mining services to the government intelligence agencies, which will um, vastly untrue to the traceable. At first, Planter's only backers were the Central Intelligence Agency's venture capital on uh, NQT, NQTEL, but the company steadily grew in 2015 and was valued at $20 billion. So, this is the company that is um, the point of discussion. But how did they get the origin of uh, Peter Thiel? We need to understand that um, you know, he started out as a lawyer. He's about 49 years old. Uh, he was born in Germany, immigrated to the United States uh, when he was a child. Uh, he has citizenships not only in the U.S., but in Germany as well as New Zealand, which is a subject of a much uh, discrimination to many New Zealanders because uh, he was viewed as something that he basically bought his citizenship uh, into the country. Um, New Zealand has a very strict um, citizen re citizen re citizenship requirement, one of the strict strictest in the world, if you, as you should say. It's very hard to become a citizen in New Zealand. Um, you know, he made his money, like I said, basically his bones through PayPal. Uh, he has been influenced by the cypherpunk movement, but he himself was not a as far as any any indication, actually a participant in the movement, really. Um, he's heavily influenced by Asimov and Libertarianism and uh, Robert Hellman and, of course, Tolkien, which he's named a number of different his, uh, products of venture capitalism after um, Tolkien, if you will say. Um, He's actually, when he was at Stanford, he did philosophy, which is very interesting. Uh, he debates on identity, politics, and political correctness in Western culture. He's, of course, not for necessarily those things. Uh, like I said, he fundamentally believes in this concept that has been um, pretty much the backbone of the cyberpunk movement. Um, I'm quoting this from the um, UFL blog which gets it from the Al piece. The Sega Cypherpunk Tenet was the Cyberpunk Code, 
as is actually implemented these things and worried or not about any consequences later. This is where PGP and Tor came from, and eventually what became Bitcoin and WikiLeaks also came out of this list. Uh, Field's mantra, which he has, don't ask for permission, ask, ask for forgiveness, is a widely adopted now in the S, uh, SV startup culture, the Silicon Valley uh, startup culture. It's just an updated take on the cypherpunk code. It's the same impulse to circumvent existing structures through technology, you know, break shit, and worry if you do at all about the consequences later. It is very staunch libertarianism in so and so co Valley now has this long, odd pedigree. So he is taken this, you know, philosophy, this, this ethos, if you will, and applied it to his business. And for a while there, a lot of people like Peter Field, and they like some of the things he's done, his investments, if you will. Not completely everything, you know, the way Facebook has turned out, even the way PayPal's turned out, and you know, sold to eBay. Um, it started out initially, he thought, or uh, his concept of starting out eBay, if you will, was that he wanted to hedge against inflation. Um, this is coming from um, Peter Thiel in 1999, for all we We're definitely onto a big thing. The need for PayPal answers monumental. Everyone in the world needs money to get paid to trade to live. Paper money is an ancient technology and inconvenient means of payment. You can run out of it. It wears. It gets lost or stolen. In the 21st century, people need a form of money that is more convenient and secure, something that can be accessed from anywhere with a PDA or an equipment connection. Of course, what we're calling convenient for American users will be revolutionary for the developing world. Many of these countries' governments pay fast and loose with their currency. They use inflation and sometimes wholesale currency devaluations, like we saw in Russia and several Southeast Asian countries last year, referring to the 1998 Russia and the 1997 Asian financial crisis, to take wealth away from the citizens. Most of the ordinary people there never had the opportunity to open an offshore account or to get their hands on more than a few bills of stable currency, like U.S. dollars. Eventually, PayPal will be able to change this. In the future, we make our services available outside the U.S. and as an internet penetrating country to expand to all economic tiers of people, PayPal will give citizens worldwide more direct control over their currency than they have had before. It is nearly impossible for corrupt governments to steal wealth from their people through their own means because if they try, people will switch to dollars or pounds or yen, in effect, definitely the worthless local currency is that they're more secure. Um, this is not something that actually happened with PayPal. Wow. It's a mechanism that people do utilize. This is something more that cryptocurrencies are doing right now, particularly Bitcoin, even with all the issues with the uh, the exhausting marathon that is the block debate and the possible hard fork, soft fork, soft fork altcoin, bonanza creation, debacle, new future frontier thing that's going on within that community. community. I also had a lot of countries that have um, stronger capital access and stronger internet infrastructure, like in China, which is um, their country has been devalued a few times by their country, which places like Venezuela, Venezuela which we talk about um, in the of the shy, are hedging their bets against, you know, using Bitcoin as a means to pay for basic services like groceries and medicine, transportation, um, things of that nature, power, electricity, well, which is free, but um, clothing, just the basic necessities, if you will, are using cryptocurrency to do that. And while PayPal didn't develop that, uh, Peter Thiel still believes in those principles and has um, um, been participant in the cryptocurrency community and uh, funded certain aspects of uh, that community. But with all this um, talk about the concept of a of, um, guaranteed idea of being a individuals being able to control their financial wealth and hedge against their government and corruption and devaluation of corrupting uh, uh, forces, his planetarium company, this data management company, this tracking of terrorists, if you will, quote unquote, uh, tracking of immigrants, is very big brother issues, very um, totalitarian, if you will. Um, I know there's a need for safety and security, but at what cost? Um, keep thinking of you know, the Benjamin Franklin quote. Uh, Those who give up essential liberty to gain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And with the 
continuous ongoing war on terrorism and it being the, um, the big bad, if you will, that the governments around the world are utilizing to you know, do things like go after uh, encryptions, putting back doors. It's either terrorism or drugs, you know, criminal, uh, you know, criminals, the bad guys. Um, you now have this mechanism that's being utilized here within the states. Um, under the previous administration and currently under this administration to track um, immigrants. So, Plantera is the name of the the company. Um, we're going to talk about right here from its website. Uh, products built for a purpose. Uh, Ten years ago, we set out to create products that would transfer the way organizations use data. Today, our products are deployed at the most critical government, commercial, and nonprofit institutions of all to solve problems we haven't seen or dreamed of back then. Um, scale, 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 speed, and agility. We build products to make people better at their most important work. The kind of work you read about on the front page of the newspaper and not just technology sections. We talk about data fusion platforms and the applications. Um, for, for any data problem, they are going to have a solution in your products, basically. Um, and so this company's sole purpose is the, the data line, if you will, and provide solutions for government. Their so solutions are for anything from anti-fraud, case management, cybersecurity, disaster preparedness, health delivery, insurance analytics, law enforcement. That's kind of scary. Um, custom uh, solutions. I don't know what plant of virus is. Capital markets, crisis response, defense, disease response, intersider threat, intelligence, legal intelligence, and pharma, pharma are so they're kind of like all over the place. They're just going to be data crunching for anyone and everyone who has the dollar to pay for it. What is Planet of Terrorists? Planet of Verified to serve the truth or correctness as, in, as by examination or research or comparison. Uh, data abuse is a real threat. It's a threat both to those organizations entrusted to care for the data as well as those whose privacy and civil liberties might be undermined through data misuse. Simple trust that data will not be misused is not sufficient. It must be possible to verify proper usage and identity of possible bad actors. With the introduction of Planned Affairs, we offer a complete framework for organizations to ensure the verification of data events, record utilization, and data security across the enterprise. By tracking the pedigree and lineage of all data, Planned Affairs enables to secure audit, auditing and comparison and audit data analysis of all enterprise data usage. So they're doing what a lot of cryptocurrencies are trying to do with decentralization, uh, crypto projects, as you say, which is to verify data, to track it, to trace it, to secure it, to, to know its origins, when it's being used, who's using it, that type of deal. But in a decentralized manner where you are kind of in control, you know, you have access to your data, you know when your data is being used or tracked or when it, where it's going, when it's going, things of that nature, and verifying it through the blockchain technology. I'm not sure what it is that they're utilizing their backbone. It might be blockchain technology, but that is an option that uh, Planet Veris is doing. So why why is this a an issue, a problem, if you will? So this is from TechCrunch, uh, written by Taylor Hatmaker. New details emerge about Planter's custom software for spy agencies. A renewed New report by the interpreter provides some compelling specifics on collaboration between uh, the Palo Alto secret of big data shop Plantera and the intelligence agencies that keep on his client roster. While some broad spokes are known about Plantera's relationship with spy agencies, the finer points point sees someone see daylight. The guarantee of secrecy, no doubt, aids the company's growth in 2017. Those cozy relationship with the presidency, keen on implementing aggressive policies with big opportunities for big data certainly can't hurt either. Plantera's work with state-sponsored state spying appears to date back in 2008 when the company denoted its software to the government communications headquarters, uh, the British counterpart to the National Security Agency. And according to the classified internal documents quoted in the report, Plantera made quite the impression. We're very impressed 
to see it to believe it. And probably beyond kicking in early money, intelligent agencies actually work directly with the company to develop custom software through an interactive collaboration between planetary computer scientists and analysis from various intelligent agencies over the course of the nearly three years. The report goes out to more detail to develop the two particular software systems, one called Kite and the other one known as X Key Score Helper. Through Kite implementation by the GCHQ, Planetarium offered deep customization. Out of the box, Kite will be able to handle a variety of types of data, data including dates, images, geolocation, etc. But GCHQ was free to extend it by writing custom fields for complicated types of data that the agency might need to analyze. To analyze. The important tools were designed to handle a variety of use cases, including statistic data sets, databases that were, were updated frequently, and data stores controlled by third parties to which uh, GCHQ was able to gain access. Design apparent collaboration with Plantera, X Key Score Helper sought to make data obtained through the NSA's muscular X Key Score program more digestible and offered a way to port it to Plantera's more analytical friendly interface. I'm going to do the quote here. Uh, was provided. So basically, the you know the emergence of these of this company, these two big huge agencies, allow for Pantera to do something which is to track people. That's what they're going to be doing for the government. Is not just for terrorists, but tackle the issue of immigration, specifically um, what this administration wants to do, which is. Um, Muslim immigration, specifically Muslim immigration, not necessarily just illegal immigration in general, but those who are coming from uh, Islamic countries deemed unworthy of entering into the United States. So this is the interpreter's article written by Sam Biddle. How Peter Thiel's Plantera helped the NSA spy on the whole world. Donald Trump has inherited the most powerful machine for spying ever devised. How this petty, eventual man might wield and expand this sprawling American spy apparatus already vulnerable to abuse is disturbing enough on its own. But the outlook is even worse considering that Trump's vast preference for private sector expertise and new strategic friendship with Silicon Valley billionaire investor Peter Thiel, whose controversial and opaque company, Alplanetera has long sought to sell governments on unattached power to ship and exploit information of any kind. Field represents a perfect nexus of government clout with the kind of corporate stack and swagger that Trump loves. The interpreter can now reveal that Planetara has worked for years to boost the global dragnet of the NSA and its international partners and was in fact co-created with American spies. Peter Thiel has become one of the most American political mainstream, most notorious figures in 2016. When it emerged, he was bankrolling a lawsuit against um, Gawker Media, uh, even before he won a direct line to the White House, uh, which is also the former employer of this particular um, writer. Now he brings to his role presidential advisor, decades of experience as keenly investor and token non-liberal and Facebook board of directors. The Rolodex of software luminaries and a decidedly Trumpian devotion to controversy and contrarianism. Perhaps the most appealing asset Thiel can offer a bewildered new president will be Plantera Technologies with Thiel founded with Alex Karp and Joe Longstone in 2004. So they are now going on their third administration with this. Um, some of this information we already know. So talk about the namesake is actually the magical sphere, sphere used by the evil ward Sam Ron to surveil, trick, and threaten his enemies across Middle Earth. So for example, a 2010 demo showed how Planetara's government could be used to chart the, fall, the flow of weapons throughout the Middle East by reporting disparate data sources like equipment lot numbers, manufacturing data, and the location of Hezbollah training camps. Um, Planetara's chief appeal is that it is now designed to do any single thing in particular, but it's flexible and powerful enough to accommodate the requirements of any organization that needs to process large mass of data, both personal and abstract data. So basically what, they, what the administration wants to do is utilize this program to, check, to track um, immigrants, and Peter Thiel has stated that this is what they're doing um, within the United States, both legal and lawful, and track their everyday movements and where they're going, who they're going with, how they're interacting, 
what countries they're visiting, if they're going in and out of the country, who they're working for, relationships, all that is going to be tracked and utilized by this program to track these people. And no doubt either um, swoop them up in raids, uh, if they're both either lawful or illegal immigrants, um, and just track people, like human cattle, if you will. And this is very, very scary. Because it's already being utilized, there's already raids going on throughout the United States um, for both um, legal immigrants and those who are not here. People are getting notices right and left. Uh, people are being deported. Uh, there's, you know, fights going through the court system about this. About the, the Muslim ban and non-Muslim ban and all these different things that the administration is doing. Uh, this particular administration, I should say, and utilizing a tool like this. So the ability to track people down, just imagine what it can be utilized once they have done the proving ground of tackling the issue um, that's came to this particular administration, which is immigration and pushing out uh, anywhere from 5 to 10 to 20 million um, illegal immigrants out of this country. And then getting rid of you know Muslim immigrants out of this country because they're not considered to be Americans or have the constitution to conform to American values, if you will. Uh, what happens when this is turned on to other avenues? For example, protesting. If you're, you know, no DAPLA, uh, you track down people that are against um, the usage of oil. They want to use alternative energies. They don't want uh, the use of you know, petrol oil, they want to use gas, or they want to use solar power, so you can now start tracking people and their movements and find out who they're associated with, um, without actually having to break into anybody's phone, or even to spy directly through bugging or infiltration into anybody's um, organization. Uh, going after people that might say, for example, have a better idea than you. The, what, what potential you know employees they will hire to make their product work or get out to market faster than yourself. There's a lot of very negative and terrible, horrible things that this could be utilized for. Um, this type of data crunching and, and the fact that it's very um, privacy intrusive. It really is. It's very privacy intrusive. And the reason why that is is you have these uh, Companies, because we, the last almost 20 years, freely given away our information through Facebook and Twitter and all these different websites and social apps. You have these things called data brokers, and they're being used um, through chillaxpot.com. Uh, they're being utilized uh, to track Muslims. So, a report from Amnesty International says a list of undocumented immigrants or even Muslims specifically residing in the United States of America is being prepped under the Trump administration. According to relevant sources, the private data brokers are already in the process of combining lists of Muslims in the country. The list is rumored to have close to a million names. The brokers will also be compiling additional lists containing details regarding Americans with Bosnian Muslim surnames and unassimilated Hispanic Americans, said the group. Company claimed to display a fairly accurate list of undocumented immigrants in the state of California. The data broker that supplied the data based on religion included big companies like Experience or a small company like such data is available right readily on the websites like extractdata.com. This website has names and addresses for almost 1.8 million Muslims in the United States, which is available by the price of $13,000, which is not a lot. Amnesty claims that the data analytics company, which chooses to, not, to be anonymous, said that they had compiled data of 3.8 million Muslims in the U.S. according to peer, to peer research and estimates in 2014. The total number of Muslims in the country is close to the number claimed by the unnamed data analytics company. Hence, it might be possible that almost all the Muslims who reside in the United States are already on this list. Most data companies that deny support of the government in building them Muslim registry. However, on the other hand, the data brokers operate in a much more liberal way. It has been rumored that more than once that the government is already in talks with these agencies for buying the concerned information. So they're basically just going to data brokers that use it for marketing research or for whatever reason to pile this information. And they might have like all sorts of desperate information, but if they were to 
channel and narrow down the information. For example, you know, Pokemon Go. You were able to do Google Plus and Facebook login um, to get into Pokemon Go. Well, people have to use their real names on Facebook. So now you have um, the real name data, for example. Uh, only Pokemon Go had Facebook, and it was Google Plus. But, for example, any type of game. So now you have the, the real data names, and you go by what are known uh, most of the first and last surnames. Now you can start narrowing the list and going by city, by zip code, and things of that nature, and having compiling lists of people by their names just through face, Facebook information. And from there, you compare it to credit card reports, to driver's license, to property, to educational information, down on and on and on to verify this information. And now you have compiled a list of um, Muslim people in America that can now be targeted for whatever government purposes. And these companies like these data brokers, companies like Pantera, they're using technology, in my opinion, for the, this type of evil purposes for the will, which unfortunately increasingly seems that the United States is it's a totalitarianism, if you will, and tracking the people because of their faith, if you will. It's a terrorism um, because they're not, they don't have the proper papers, if you will. Mind you, never targeting the actual companies to hire the people that don't have the papers. Um, that is never ever discussed. As someone who lived in the southwest of the United States, it was a very common practice to hire um, illegals in this country, people that don't have their papers, to take full advantage of them. Whether they are paying them under the table or not paying them the actual value of that job, uh, these companies, if they're paying them under the table, then they're not paying the, the FICA, they're not paying Social Security, they're not paying Medicare, they're not paying payroll taxes, they're not paying the appropriate taxes, if, if you will. Uh, for utilizing that worker for that particular job, and that money is going in their pockets, and that going towards the resources that are necessary for the state to function. I mean, if they're a construction company, their, their trucks are going down the road. They're, they're buying material and stuff like that, inspections and permits, and all the things like that, that for that new building. None of that is going into the, really truly the local resources, if you will. It's just being swapped off into whatever that individual utilizes that company. And it's not really for the most part going into expanding that person's business. It's going to buy, you know, their second or third home, luxury items, or building up trust, and sending their kids to college, all these luxurious item type of things. They're not really um, slashing into the, the state coffers to be able to pay for roads, to pay for housing, to pay for medical expenses, to go to the appropriate taxes. And they're a company that is operating in the states, uh, you're utilizing a lot of state resources, whether it's people are willing to admit that or not, and you're not paying your full share, your full wage, if you will, your full fare. And it's been going on for decades. This is why um, a lot of states are struggling with their state benefits, if you will, because they're not actually truly, if you look at the, the amount that's being outputted as far as economically, um, collecting the amount of taxes that they should be. But that's never discussed. That's never a big issue. It's always the issue of the evil, you know, the immigrant, the evil parents, if you will. It's very kind of dystopian last thing that's going on, which falls in the realm of the cyberpunk bill, where how in a day, in this day and age, where data mining is a thing, been there for a while, but it's now that become so sophisticated that you can literally track people down to square foot, if you will. Uh, what can you do to protect yourself? How can you be anonymous? Because even if you yourself as a person take all the precautions of being anonymous and protect your information, you, there's no way for you to know that the people you interact with take those same precautions. And so, I'm not sure what exactly the solution is, what laws can be put in place, what technology we can be utilized to protect individuals, what security, what privacy precautions precaution can happen. It's just it's, it's very disgusting to me that this type of company, it's not the only company out there that exists and is being done in 
these, these tools are being utilized to to terrorize and, and to harm and go after people just for for their creed, you know, for their ethnicity, for their religious basis, because of their status um, is not um, recognized by a certain subset of people that are control the government. They don't qualify as a um, full human being, if you will. So on to some kind of positive stuff there, here. Um, so some tech ideas. Um, Tor app Orbit, which is on Android, I have a link in the show notes, basically allows you to connect through the use of your Android device to Tor so that you can navigate safely and securely as best of your ability. Uh, I also recommend using the VPN as well. Um, the use of Tor and navigating online. Um, so you can try to mitigate, if you will, the metadata out there about yourself and your activities. Um, your build your own project. I have two links in here in the show notes of how you can, if you wish to choose to do so, build your own self-car. Uh, they just call it Elkin Project, which is elkinproject.org, and you, uh, udacity.com. Also, you can help people through the use of crowdsourcing and open source to enable people to build their own self-driving car. So you don't have to go you know, buy Tesla or use an Uber or Ford or any of these big, car manufacturing companies. You can either build yours one yourself by scratch or utilize an already existing um, vehicle that you have to make it self-driving. The other thing is that uh, something you can support is that Raspberry Pi has released a Raspberry Pi Y. It's called Raspberry Pi Zero, which now has Wi-Fi. Uh, it's recently released. Uh, this is something you can support. Um, you can purchase a directly through um, the Raspberry Pi organization or there are many um, store sponsors. They also are on Amazon. I've seen uh, Raspberry Pis on eBay, um, various computer sites um, have these Raspberry Pis for sale. You can also help support the uh, ongoing effort out there and to help kids learn how to use Raspberry Pis. They have various groups, uh, support groups, meetups, things of that nature to help either uh, fund by you know, donating your money or your time to help kids uh, get involved into STEM programs, get involved into computer learning. Um, knowing how to code, knowing how to build, is reading, writing, and driving, these skill sets that you possess and know how to do. I'll put the fourth, like mathematics, like basic arithmetic. Uh, you could be successful, you can get by very well, at least here in the States, um, very well in if you master these basic skill sets, you can do all right. You can make a basic movie if you want. And lastly, um, the manifest self. The Pi In Net Time Manifesto. This was written um, May 26, 1987. A press release by the 19 being an ad hoc community press conference. Um, 295 1997 at 7 o'clock. Vienna, Austria, which was a Thursday. Participants is Pitt Schultz of Berlin, Reet Lovin of Amsterdam, Critical Artness Emily of Chicago, uh, Diane McCarthy of Budapest, Marco uh, Beljan of Lebanon. I apologize. Oliver uh, Marchart, Marchart uh, Wynn, and Peter uh, Rabon Wilson of New York. Why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. That's what Willie Sutton, the famous bank, bank robber. Last week, net timers frolicked in the real space time continuum on the Slovenian coast in the town of Korean, where the following bullets were established. Net time declares information. We denounce hand capitalism and demand reparations. Cyberspace is where your bankruptcy takes place. Nighttime launches crusades against data barbers, barbers and the virtual holy land. We celebrate the remapping of the, e, of the X East and X West and the return to geography. We respect the return to alt culture, alt.com, alt 
got cultures and pagan software structures. It's normal. Depriving corporate content liberate the virtual enclosures and storm the content castles. Refuse the institutions into refuse the institutionalization of net processes. Reject pornography on the net unless well made. We still until this day reject make work schemes and libertarian declarations of independence. NGOs are the future oppressive post governments of the world. We support experimental data transfer technology. Participate in the net time retirement plan, zero work by age 40. The critique of the image is the defense of the imagination. Net time can be dream time. Questions being addressed to the participants in the net time press. Conference by public net base of Museum Porter, Vienna, Vienna, 29.5.1997. That is a manifesto, very short, very sweet. Um, very succinct, I think. And this is a lot of like I said, it's a very bullet point statement of what a lot of people are feeling at the time and still do. Uh, I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, until next time, uh, I'll see you on the show. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shy Space Odyssey Network production.